thank you all for coming today to the Humanities Forum. The Humanities Forum is an opportunity for members of the Providence College community to engage regularly in intellectual life outside of class, to deepen their appreciation for the humanities and to explore diverse perspectives from on and off campus. About to choke on my own coffee. These lecture events occur regularly, typically in this room at this time, so Fridays throughout the semester, fall and spring. Um, and it gives you the opportunity to hear from and speak with scholars from around the country in various disciplines as they introduce to you the questions that inspire their work. So I'm very pleased to welcome today's guest, Professor James Caesar, the Harry F. Byrd Professor of Politics at the University of Virginia. Professor Caesar is the author of several books on American politics and American political thought, including major studies on how presidents are selected, on the symbolism of America in modern thought, and on the continued importance of the founding in American government, which I think we'll have, he'll be speaking to to some degree today. He's also co-authored book-length studies of every presidential election between 1992 and 2016, and has been a regular contributor to the popular presses, ranging from the Los Angeles Times and the Weekly Standard to the Atlantic and National Review. At the University of Virginia, Professor Caesar is the founder and the director of the Program on Constitutionalism and Democracy. And that program offers students a curriculum of political studies for higher education, which is designed to foster an enlightened body of citizens for a liberal democracy. What that means, in other words, is to make sure that you, dear student, know the ideas and principles you really need to know in order to be the citizen of a free society. So you're welcome to ask Professor Caesar questions about that or about anything else you hear today because at the end of today's talk, there will be plenty of time for Q&A. So please listen actively and formulate questions accordingly. Um, and in closing, I should note that today's forum is part of a series of events sponsored by the Frederick Douglass Project at Providence College. The Frederick Douglass Project is an initiative of the Humanities Program and supported by funding from the Jack Miller Center. It aims to cultivate in students the skills of reasoned debate and persuasion necessary for a healthy and free society. The Douglass Project promotes greater understanding of the importance of rational disputation and persuasion in our democracy and offers students the opportunity to practice those arts. So you'll be hearing from me at various points over the next six to eight months about that. Um, with various speakers, workshops, and in the spring, a persuasive essay and public speaking contest. Back to Professor Caesar. He holds his PhD from Harvard University and has won many major national awards for his scholarship and his teaching. He's one of the nation's foremost scholars in the fields of public diplomacy and civic education, as well as American political thought. And I hope you give him your undivided attention. Please join me in welcoming Dr. James Caesar. Thank you very much. Can everyone hear me? Good. Good. Well, thanks for the opportunity to, uh, to speak to, to this audience this afternoon. Um, we're still within the, the window of Constitution Day, which took place just a, a week ago. This period is meant to uh, remember or, or celebrate the signing of the proposed Constitution in 1787 following the convention in Philadelphia. It was uh, followed by a, an intense nine months debate or so on ratification of the Constitution, which uh, ended uh, with its acceptance, as we all know. You may be uh, surprised to learn that since 2004, virtually every college and university is obliged by federal law to have uh, a, an educational event on this subject. Um, I'm not sure if the law in any way envisions a, peer, a, a penalty in the event that uh, this obligation is not fulfilled, you know, like sending a dean or a provost before a federal court for, uh, to be reprimanded and before being gently pardoned. But in, in any case, um, th that's where things stand on the legal point of view, and I hope what I say today will relieve anyone of this responsibility if they happen to be in it. Um, in any case, the the talk I have today um, uh, focuses on, and I'll give you a quick syllabus and then begin, it focuses on 
this question of founding. What, what exactly is founding? How the idea of found, founding emerged in ancient Greece, uh, followed by its uh, further reflection in early modern political thought, namely by Machiavelli. How this idea of founding was dismissed or forgotten in the 18th century, especially in English thought. And finally, how this idea was brought back in America during the ratification debate by James Madison, who's the central figure in this talk. So uh, with that uh, as a uh, beginning, with more than 2,000 years to cover, let me, let me uh, start the, the talk today. Americans today speak regularly of our founders and our founding. These words seem perfectly obvious and natural. We celebrate our founders and the names given to countless streets, schools, uh, and the like, none more iconic than Madison Avenue. Textbooks on American politics almost all have a chapter on the founding, and courses on the American political system often begin with at least a mention of the founders. With all this attention given to the founding and founders, it may seem a little bit strange that we're imprecise when it comes to deciding who exactly uh, th these terms should apply to. Some use the word founders to refer to the heroes of the revolution, above all Washington. Others to the author of the Declaration of Independence, that would be uh, Thomas Jefferson. And some finally to one of the principal authors of the National Constitution, in 1787, so maybe James Madison, who's also known as the father of the Constitution, would fit that bill. All of these persons, I suppose, might be considered our founders, and if you happen to go to a July 4th celebration between eating grilled hot dogs and enjoying the fireworks, I doubt if anyone would take much offense if people celebrated, along with Thomas Jefferson, say George Washington and Alexander Hamilton. So, so all, all fit. Yet, if we persist in asking which of these different moments should be designated the founding, most historians today, I think, would probably bestow the honor on those who created the Constitution in 1787. And yet, and this may sound strange, no one in 1787 spoke of the authors of the Constitution as founders. None of the delegates at the close of the convention, so far as I know, refer to themselves as founders. In fact, the term founder or, or lawmaker with a capital L was seldom if ever used at the time. It could be found only in older books that referred to some of the great figures of antiquity, like Moses, who led the Hebrews out of Egypt, or Romulus, who established the ancient city of Rome, or Lycurgus, who's credited with setting up the ancient Greek city of Sparta. So today, no one can imagine that the idea of founding ever needed to be revived or established, but it did. So before there could be a modern founding, there had to be a revival of the idea of founding. The term and the concept had to be brought back into modern currency and reintroduced into the modern lexicon to become part of modern day thinking. Credit for doing this belongs to James Madison. It was Madison who, during the ratification debate on the Constitution, explicitly brought back the theme of the founder. It was Madison who began to compare those who had authored the Constitution to the great lawgivers of antiquity. For this reason, James Madison deserves the title of being founder of the modern idea of founding. So it's especially fitting to remember him on Constitution Day. He provided the intellectual breakthrough that resurrected the concept of founding. Uh, let's spend a, a minute then be on the concept of founding, which was so critical to the thinkers of classical Greece and Rome. Founding was the central theme really in political science and classical thought. It was the place where one began the investigation of all politics. And in a way, this makes sense. If you know how to start something and set it up, if you know how to put together the pieces of something together, you arguably know the most important thing about it. One wouldn't want to build a house unless you had a good house planner or architect. Same with building a city. Now, I admit things, of course, sometimes occur uh, on their own and by accident. But according to classical thinkers, the best chance to build a political system depends on beginning with a rough plan. A desired outcome doesn't take place by accident. 
A political order is something that needs to be consciously made. It is fashioned by an individual who sets out to establish a workable government, or at any rate, the best government possible under existing circumstances. The individual who performs this task is the one we know as the founder. Classical writings uh, on politics are filled with accounts of the founders who established the political order, like Theseus and Solon in Athens, Minos in Crete, Romulus in Rome. Probably the greatest Greek founder of them all, though, was Lycurgus of Sparta. The Roman historian Plutarch tells us, and I quote him here, the city of Sparta was considered the chief city of all Greece for the space of 500 years in strict observance of Lycurgus's laws. If by chance the person Lycurgus somehow has been excluded from your education, you'll probably at least know something about the Spartans. The Spartans live on today as the name given to the splendid athletes of Michigan State University. Spartans were renowned for being uniquely great soldiers, and to this day, the name Spartan bestows distinction like no other. Could you man a imagine a university today, say the Friars of Providence College, of taking the basketball court and calling their players Athenians? It just wouldn't work. Spartan is the key word. Well, perhaps some of you may also have seen the Hollywood movie 300, in this movie, just 300 of the Spartans' finest, um, their mighty muscles bulging beneath their breastplates, hold off the whole of the Persian army for over a week at the epic battle of Thermopylae. Let's go back for a minute then and ask how this uh, city of Sparta got going. Two things were involved in the process. First, there is a body of knowledge of how to set up a good government. This knowledge is the core of what we know as political science. Lycurgus, in fact, studied political science, though he never earned a diploma. Prior to becoming Sparta's founder, he went on a voyage to the different island nations of the Aegean Sea and took notes on the different forms of government in each of these states and how well or poorly they fared. Lycurgus, in other words, studied comparative government. In Crete, Lycurgus spent time with the philosopher poet by the name of Thales who had closely studied the origin of Crete's fine political system. Thales developed the science of politics, an understanding of what works and what doesn't, and what produces admirable results. The person who possesses this kind of theoretical knowledge of how to set up a city, a person, say, like Thales in Crete, or better still, a philosopher like Aristotle, is not the one who actually performs the task of establishing the city, he is the teacher of the science of politics. He might be called a proto-founder or an invisible founder, who through his writing and teachings gives the founder counsel and advice, as Thales did uh, for Lycurgus. The second thing involved in founding is the action of carrying out the plan itself, since circumstances differ so greatly from one place to another, and since so many decisions have to be made right on the spot. What the proto-founder can supply only goes so far. Much is inevitably left to the founder who's acting on the spot. What needs to be decided is of immense difficulty. It can involve getting the people of a city to change dramatically their ways, adapt new ways of thinking, and transform entirely their educational system. James Madison was the author, uh, one of the authors of the Federalist Papers. It consists of a series of newspaper essays that he, along with uh, Alexander Hamilton and John Jay, wrote during the ratification debate to explain the Constitution and, uh, of course, to try to persuade the American people to support it. At one, at one point in these essays, Madison curiously turns to discussing the, cl the classical Greek founders. He mentions 14 of them. Some of these men, he tells us, ended by settling for much less than they might have wished for. They couldn't, or they didn't, institute all the changes they wanted. In certain cases, perhaps prevailing circumstances dictated what they could accomplish, and they had little choice but to compromise. In other cases, it seems like they were too fearful of risking uh, everything to try and reform a, a people. Their plans could fail. The Athenian founder Solon is an example. 
Solon confessed, Madison tells us, I quote him again, that he had not given his countrymen the government best suited to their happiness, but the one most tolerable to their prejudices. Other great uh, founders, Madison goes on, were more true to their object. They sought what they thought was the very best outcome, exposing themselves and their project to enormous risk in doing so. Like Kyrgyz, Madison says, was one of these men. He refounded Sparta, in Madison's words, by making use of violence and the authority of superstition. He employed coercion and practiced trickery to achieve his objectives. He used some of the armed forces he had at his disposal. He told half-truths to the populace, and he convinced many to follow him on the basis of the authority of the gods. The task of founding, it turns out, is different from ordinary governing. Many of the techniques that Lycurgus used to found his system were not ones that he wanted to see employed once the political system of Sparta was actually established. So founding is a distinct and extraordinarily difficult process. The methods used in founding are often very different from those that keep an existing system going. There are two modes of politics then, the mode of founding and the mode of uh, normal governing. Political philosophers in early modern times followed the classics in emphasizing the centrality of this theme of founding. For them, as for the classics, founding was the most important activity in politics. Among these political philosophers was someone you no doubt have heard of, the famous or infamous Niccolo Machiavelli. Machiavelli adopted and reformulated classical ideas about founding. For one thing, Machiavelli brought the founder himself into the equation. Machiavelli asks how the founder satisfies his own personal interests in founding. No longer did Machiavelli assume, as he said the classical thinkers often did, that a founder acts naturally for the good of his own compatriots. The founder has to get something out of founding, something for his own benefit, for why else would he do it? The founder's own goals might must first be satisfied and then squared with promoting the public good. Now, our own Declaration of Independence, I'm sure you all memorized it, the whole of it, um, for example, ends with the famous promise that the signers of the document pledge, and I quote, their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. Machiavelli would say that such words are no more than rhetoric. Founders act first to achieve their own goal, which is glory, and perhaps, and renown. Machiavelli's account of founding takes note of the same two basic elements I mentioned in discussing Plutarch. First, there's the general science of founding. It's discovered and developed by the philosopher or political scientist, the one I would call the proto-founder. The proto-founder stretches out, the, sketches out the rules for the government of princes. Machiavelli himself was a teacher or proto-founder, and he speaks to many of them through his book, The Prince, and directly and not directly to just one person, as Thales did to Lycurgus. Among his readers, and there were thousands of them over the centuries that read this famous book, uh, among his readers would be potential founders. Machiavelli believed his political science to be superior to that of the classics, and the reason was it was more realistic. Classical proto-founders and theorists, he argues, spent much of their time mistakenly discussing the imaginary political system that he says had never been seen or known to exist in truth. The classical founders, he said, were idealists who preferred to speak of what should be done rather than what is done. They were a goody-goody two-shoes who avoided telling things as they were. They minimized the blood and the deceit needed to be a truly successful founder. Machiavelli proceeded in just the opposite way. He delighted in speaking at length of all the brutal and nasty details of founding. This was in part a literary technique of shock and awe meant to attract the attention of young readers. The Prince became, as I said, one of the most widely read books for centuries, in part because so many uh, established leaders tried to suppress it. But there was Machiavelli telling readers what they really needed. He who lets go of what is done for what should be done only learns his ruin. A second, as with 
Plutarch, Machiavelli, writes about the actual founder, the ones who engage in the activity of setting up a new political order. Among the greatest examples, he mentions Moses, Cyrus, Romulus, and Theseus. These founders, he said, took the lead in, in the introduction of a new order of things. They made use of their own arms. Machiavelli specifies some of the properties of actual founding. The founder, he tells us, always acts by himself. Founding is an individual activity, not the work of a group. No one would ever rely on a faculty, faculty committee to found anything. On this point, Machiavelli excuses the action of Romulus, the founder of Rome, who got rid of, that is, brutally murdered, his brother Remus. Machiavelli treats this as an act of excusable fascicide. Things are never entirely reformed, he says, unless it is done by only one individual. A founder should be alone in caring his project into effect. Founding in uh, a new modern order is an act of great difficulty. It requires an extraordinary amount of authority. But here, here's a question Machiavelli raises. Where does the founder acquire this kind of authority, especially if he be begins by holding no previous position or office? He's someone from outside anyone who has a, a, an official position. Authority initially comes, Machiavelli tells us, from taking advantage of an opportunity, by which he means a situation in which people are faced with the direst of circumstances. They will then consider listening and obeying on their own because at that moment they feel that a need for a change is absolutely necessary. So an opportunity in modern terms is a crisis, and a crisis for which the founder is not responsible. A crisis is one of President, Ob as one of President Obama's uh, advisors rightly claimed, is a terrible thing to waste. And you notice in presidential campaigns how one tries to show we're in a period of crisis, things are terrible, meaning that the people will willingly uh, shift to another leader. Under conditions of crisis, people are inclined to follow the founder. But this spontaneous inclination to follow may only last so long. When things get tough, as they invariably do, people begin to fall away, and they cease to willingly obey. People, in other words, are fickle. Look at Moses, who founded his found his people enslaved in Egypt, desperate to get out. That was the crisis that provided Moses a willing following. He led his people out of Egypt, but only to find that once in the wilderness, in a condition in which people were without water and food, they began to grumble, to grow discontented, and eventually to revolt. A founder at some point, Machiavelli says, must therefore compel obedience. Things must be ordered in such a way, he writes, that when the people no longer believe something on their own, the founder can make them believe by force. An unarmed founder, one who hopes to operate continually without force, will be unable to succeed. Force is a necessity. Force refers either to the use of physical arms or to psychological manipulation, most often by using religion to instill fear in the minds of, of uh, the people. Here's a final point about Machiavelli. Um, it's difficult to grasp, but uh, I think I probably shouldn't mention it, especially before the audience here today. So uh, Machiavelli divides founding into different types at different levels. On one rung of the ladder, there's the act of changing the frame of government inside a particular state. Take our own founding in 1787. Our founders got rid of the Articles of Confederation, which uh, really are America's, was America's first republic, and changed to the Constitution, which is our, our second republic. Now, a second step in the ladder is the creation of an altogether new kind of political form. So Alexander the Great began his career as ruler of a middling nation, Macedonia. From this modest beginning, he proceeded not just to change Macedonia, which is a small thing, but to build a huge empire that covered the greater part of the known world. He built a new political form, the empire, different from what would, had previously been there. And now the third and final rung on the ladder, and here you need to exercise a little imagination. It involves tr a transformation 
that's not political in the ordinary sense of controlling land and territory. It refers instead to a person who seeks to change the character of an entire culture or civilization. A civilization can change, for example, from paganism, when all worshiped local gods uh, at the turn of the first century, to Christianity, when all eventually professed belief in the Trinity. Jesus and Paul brought about this monumental transformation of the West. They were founders, though not in the sense of changing a regular political order. In Machiavelli's sense, they changed how people thought and acted, changed the civilization. Machiavelli, many claimed, sought to change the entirety of the culture or civilization in the West, to launch the process of transforming it from a Christian civilization to a civilization dom uh, dominated by secular enlightenment ideas, a new era when people would turn from uh, a, a founding authority in an act of, uh, an, in an act of God establishing authority on the basis of reason. That was the change that he sought. Um, in these cases, the one I refer to as the proto-founder becomes the actual founder, acting across generations or centuries, um, though uh, through the reading of his books. So in a way, the philosopher or the thinker or the political scientist can turn into the most important kind of founder, at least Machiavelli claimed. And Machiavelli's disposition was to try to change the whole character of the West and the political universe in which we live. So, you know, when you get a chance to study the importance of ideas, you can see that they eventually can have, presumably, immense political consequences. So much for some of the teachers about founding. It turns out by the time of the American Revolution, fewer political thinkers were talking much about the concept of founding. This was especially so in the thought that took place in Great Britain, which is so important to us because we take so many of our ideas from uh, uh, British politics. Yet, the figure of the founder is surprisingly absent from the two major schools of British thought in the 18th century. The idea of the founder has pretty much vanished, perhaps because British thinkers thought that the whole idea of founding was inapplicable to modern times, or perhaps they wished deliberately to discourage would-be Machiavellian-type leaders from upsetting the political world in which they lived. Whatever the case, the British offered two different schools of thought to get rid of the founder. First, there's contract theory, which derives largely from John Locke, said to be the foundation of our system. Governments, Locke argued, are formed by individuals who voluntarily come together on the basis of their reasonable calculations of how best to secure their primary right, above all the right to life and to protection of their property. The political science of contract theory explains how people living in a state of nature, which is not the, nothing other than a situation without government, come to, to understand that they need to exit from this condition where rights are so precarious. They form together a contract and transition into a civil society with a civil government. Contract theory offers a model for establishing a sound political order. It sets up a civil society that is no need of a founder and no need of one who has extraordinary authority. The origin of civil society is or should be a reasonable and semi-automatic process in which the people themselves see the logic of coming together on their own and agreeing on a social compact. So contract theory stands in opposition to the model of founding. It eliminates reliance of, uh, on a founder. The emergence of a civil society rests instead on man's reason and interest waiting for a great and heroic founder to arrive, a Moses or Romulus, is something no one can guarantee, but it's no longer necessary. The social contract replaces the need of a founder. Take a look at most of the contract theorists. Where is the figure of the founder? What was once the central theme of all political science, the founder has pretty much disappeared. Now the other school of 18th century British thought is known as organic theory. Thinkers from this school, above all Edmund Burke, taught that the English Constitution formed gradually over time on its own. It was never consciously made by anyone, and there was never a single moment when it was founded or started. Everything came about by accident. England's magnificent Constitution grew on its own, like a splendid British oak tree. 
It added now this limb and now that one, but without an overall plan. Human intelligence and planning played some role along the way, but only by way of making modest reforms, never by revolutions or forming entirely new forms of government. There's no such thing as wholesale transformation. There is no founder. Organic theory further argued that a science of politics is unequal to the task of founding. The, jo the job of doing so is just too complex. Planning a new society goes beyond what any single human being, regardless of his intelligence, can accomplish. To think otherwise is to be guilty of unbelievable conceit or hubris. In addition, the extraordinary authority needed to carry out founding as described is dangerous because it puts both authority in the hands of one person and centralizes all power in his person. It is authority without limit. It's tyrannical. This behavior and example will never easily be forgotten. Proponents of organic theory presented their account of English constitutional development uh, as the actual history of their nation. Their histories were perhaps meant to be accurate, but more likely they were um, using history to promote a narrative that favored their preferred political science. Their history was fashioned or designed not to tell the exact truth, but to promote the public good. Organic theory dampens enthusiasm for thinking in terms of clean slates and new beginnings. It seeks to exclude the idea of founding from public political theory. Edmund Burke explained that the British Constitution had not been formed, I quote him, upon a regular plan or with any unity of design, so no plan. Instead, he went on, it just grew in a great length of time and by a great variety of accidents. A good plan, therefore, is a non-plan. A good constitution recoils at the very thought of tearing down old structures. As for political founding, Burke said this, the very idea of the fabrication of a new government is enough to fill us with disgust and with horror. Well, now finally, American political thought. American political thought broke definitively with both of these schools of British thought. Thinkers in Britain eliminated the concept of founding, but Americans, as we'll see, led by James Madison, brought back the idea of founding and made it, as, had, as it had been in classical time, a central concept of political science. For all the similarities that exist between English and American thought, for all the ways that we have borrowed from and built on English ideas, there's a decisive difference that divides the two countries. Americans embrace the idea of founding. The British do not. The book The Federalists opens by challenging the claim of British organic theory that good political constitutions result from unplanned growth and happy accidents. In fact, The Federalist tells us it's just the opposite. America is presenting the modern world with the fundamental choice. It is for America to determine, and here I quote a difficult sentence from The Federalist, but it's, it's for America to determine whether societies of men are capable or not of establishing good government from reflection and choice, or whether they are forever destined to depend for their good government uh, on accident and force. Establishing good government, according to the Federalists, therefore is best achieved by the conscious and intentional making of something. Relying on what develops spontaneously will most often lead to failure. The ratification of the Constitution, he says, therefore will be a pivot point in modern history. It will change the future character of the political world. It will confirm that we had begun with the American revolutions and what was said of that, that we reared the fabrics of governments which have no model on the face of the globe. We started something new. The Federalist embrace of the concept of founding brings greatness back at the level of, to the level of political life. There are now persons on the scene performing extraordinary de deeds at critical moments. Above all, the founders most responsible for producing our Constitution. These men possess knowledge of the, uh, knowledge of the uh, science of politics, as well as sound judgment in determining how theoretical knowledge could best be applied in the circumstances they face. And these men had persistence and boldness to pursue the nation's interests for its own sake, not to attain the glory and renown sought by the Machiavellian founders. 
This way of thinking culminates in James Madison's explicit discussion of the theme of the founder. Madison in the Federalist Papers compares the actions of America's founders to the storied figures of antiquity. What is taking place in America is a founding of the greatest consequence, a founding as important as what took place in the cities of ancient Greece. If the Constitution is ratified, American founders will become not just worthy rivals of the ancient Greek founders, they will be their superiors. Americans, I cite Madison, have made improvements on the ancient mode of preparing and establishing regular plans of government. The American founder, not the classical founder, may become the supreme model of the future. Now, I'd like the time to review what, uh, whether Madison could support this thesis. That's disputable. But there's one improvement that's essential to mention in the last part of the talk, and it has to do with a written constitution. Now, this instrument of a written constitution was actually an innovation, a new thing, or so Americans thought, that began in the American states at the time of the Revolution, just after Amer Americans de declared independence from Britain. At that point, the different states had the necessary task of immediately forming some time, type of new government. The written constitution, or so Americans believed, had never been tried before. The idea was to set down on paper or parchment a plan of the framework for the whole of government. This procedure would enable the people's representatives or uh, the people acting in special conventions to decide if they wanted to support the plan or not. Yet just as important as adopting a written constitution was to decide what kind of document a written constitution is and how the public should understand it. Here's where Madison stepped up again and made what is perhaps the most extraordinary contribution to our founding. All agreed that the national constitution should stand at the top or the apex of ordinary law and have the legal status of being, as the Constitution says, the supreme law of the land. Well, so far, so good. Acting on his own after the convention, Madison in the Federalist Paper added something entirely new. The Constitution, he argued, should function as something more than ordinary law. The Constitution should be seen by the American people as a largely enduring document and, not, and a national symbol that connects the founding period to future generations in America. This did not mean that the Constitution could never be altered or changed, but the Constitution's essence would remain largely intact. The Constitution will only be able to achieve this status if it's placed on a higher plane than ordinary law, if it is treated by the public, and here Madison introduces two key and strange terms, if it's treated by the public with reverence and with veneration. The Constitution, he said, should have the ongoing support of the community on its side. Future Americans would understand our national written Constitution as almost a hallowed form of document. Our national Constitution is widely thought of today as a document that, uh, so to speak, asks to be revered. It resides in a great building in Washington that looks very much like a mighty temple. It's identified as a national emblem. It may surprise you to learn, however, that uh, at uh, the close of the Constitution in 1787, no one, I think, thought this way. The idea of a sentiment of reverence and the idea of a written Constitution were two wholly different and connected things. They did not go hand in hand. When people thought of a written Constitution, reverence did not come to their mind. And step back a moment. When you think about it, there's no obvious reason why these two things, that is a written constitution and reverence, should be connected. This can be easily shown. Think, for example, of how many people, uh, and, how many people and what they think about their own state constitutions. Now, state constitutions are written documents, just like the founders. In most states, a sentiment of reverence for the written constitution simply doesn't exist. Many state constitutions have been wholly rewritten, and in some states, it's a requirement that they must rewrite it. They're frequently changed and amended. It would take a person, I think, of peculiar temperament, if not questionable sanity, to venerate the Constitution of California. Madison's most extraordinary innovation is one that has come 
to be seen today as a commonplace in our thought. That, uh, so much so that we no longer appreciate that it is an innovation. His idea was to join the sentiment of reverence to our written constitution, to make a mere piece of paper into something we venerate. Madison deployed this innovation in response to a proposal made by Thomas Jefferson. Now, on the basis of observing the preparation of earlier written constitution in the states, Jefferson proposed making regular and periodic revisions of all constitutions. You had to redo a constitution every generation, he wrote. Jefferson regarded a written constitution as more or less ordinary law. Yes, a constitution was higher or supreme law while it lasted, but it should be regularly updated and improved. Not only that, Jefferson argued, but the circumstances change in each place. And no one knows better than um, the previous generation how to build a good constitution. We're always progressing. Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, Joe Biden, Mitch McConnell know better than James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, Benjamin Franklin, and George Washington. If we pay deference to the past and to founders, we make ourselves subservient to the past and to ancient prejudices. We say we follow in their footsteps, but we're not uh, good enough to stand up on our own. Jefferson went further. Not only did he oppose the idea of honoring the past, but he mocked it. He mocked the idea of the ones who wrote the Constitution being considered founders. Have a listen to what he said. Some men look at Constitution with sanctimonious reverence and deem them like the Ark of the Covenant, too sacred to be touched. They ascribe to the men of the preceding age a wisdom more than human and suppose what they did to be beyond amendment. Nonsense, Jefferson said. Laws and institution must go hand in hand with the progress of the human mind. Jefferson's understanding of the character of a written constitution, I believe, was probably the predominant view in 1787. Written constitutions were a little bit special, yes, but not much. Those who wrote these constitutions were maybe a little bit special people, but again, not by much. There was no thought that those who were the authors of these constitutions were in any sense founders. Madison was a great friend of Jefferson, and on most things the two ended up working together. But not on this issue. Madison not only took the opposite view of Jefferson, but he argued posi his position publicly in the Federalist. Madison lived through the experience of preparing the new constitution in Philadelphia and for being one of the leading founders at the National Convention. He lived through the whole event, seeing it almost fall apart and fail. Jefferson, meanwhile, was serving as America's minister to France in Paris and never had that experience. Madison came to appreciate the extraordinary difficulty, indeed the impossibility of reach, near impossibility of reaching agreement on a constitution. To insist on regular and periodic revisions of the constitution was far too risky. What was there to think of the repetition of the experiment time and time again? Better, Madison thought, to lock in the gains of 1787, shield those gains from the vicissitudes of future politics, and protect them from being changed by persons in the future who would have less likely, less knowledge than the founders of political science at Philadelphia. The leading figures of this constitutional convention, therefore, Madison began to call founders. Finally, there's something even more important to, uh, for Madison than these different practical arguments. It is the great question of how a people tend to think about the political world in which they live. Redoing the Constitution every generation teaches a people to forget or dismiss the past and to think that everything new is necessary is necessarily for the better. It destroys the very idea of connecting founding to the Constitution. By contrast, constitutional uh, veneration predisposes the people to value the past, not to the point of accepting everything, but to the point of considering with great care how our constitutional founders thought and why they decided what they did. Constitutional reverence keeps us in mind of what the men of 1787 accomplished. We remain connected to their ideas. Reverence for the Constitution depends on the fact that we think of those who wrote it as our founders. Without thinking in this way, we would not have founders at all.
Thank you. This microphone working? Yes. And we always like to give the first question to a student, if a student is willing to rise to the occasion. Um, and just when you ask your question, make sure that you wait for me to hustle over and give you the microphone, because otherwise, history will not record nor long remember what you say. <laughs> so initial questions for Professor Caesar. Thank you for your talk, Dr. Caesar. I really appreciate it. Um, I just want to pick up on the last part of your talk, uh, someone who's certainly more of a Madisonian than a Jeffersonian. Uh, it seems to me that there's, there's been an erosion, not only of attachment to the Constitution, the kind that uh, a lot of the founders were concerned with, uh, but even an erosion of confidence in, in democracy itself. And so I guess my very big question to you is, how do those of us concerned with civic education address this efficaciously, do you think? Yeah. <clears throat> Difficult question today, because in, in a way it runs counter what Madison was asking for, for people to connect themselves to the past and to their political science. And it certainly speaks to, I think, the dominant character today, I won't say the overwhelming character, but the dominant character today which looks back on the past with contempt. Uh, it's, uh, uh, we're more Jeffersonian in that, in that respect. How many people think it's important to go back and uh, see what the founders did and how they accomplished it, where they had to make compromises, the difficulties they faced? No, we're convinced that we have a better way. And uh, uh, very few, uh, it seems, hesitate to take, take that position. Um, so, so that's the dominant spirit, and they said it's not the exclusive one. It, of course, can be, um, repudiated, or at least uh, um, called into question, by uh, events like this one, not this particular event, but Constitution Day events, which try and remind Americans of the importance of uh, reverence and veneration. These are odd terms to use today. Uh, they're contrary to the spirit of, of many today, but I, I think they're good terms. I know this, whatever happens to America in the future, when we look back on this generation, um, well, obviously say that this generation didn't know everything. They thought they knew everything. They thought that everything was working in their direction, but it's, it's not true. Um, so in, in a way, we're, we're in a dilemma, but a not an insoluble dilemma. So I can't solve the problem other than to say um, the process of education, universities, so uh, maybe this law passed by the federal government wasn't such a bad idea after all. Uh, requiring you to do something on Constitution Day, especially what goes on in the high schools, to try and rekindle an understanding of constitutions. It's a, it's a tough fight, though. As I mentioned, state constitution, no one could name the founder of their state constitution. Who founded Rhode Island's state constitution? I didn't look that up, but probably some nice individual or others. Maybe people know that John Adams wrote the Constitution of Massachusetts, a few other cases like that. But the, uh, people don't know anything about their uh, constitution. And look at other constitutions in the world. We have the European constitution. I don't know, hundreds of pages and things like that. How many people revere it or, or think of it as special, let's say? Maybe revere is too strong a word. Think of it as special. No, it's just ordinary law. So, so you lose connection with the thought of those people. And if you believe, and I do believe, that wh whatever mistakes you might say the founders made or were forced into making, that they were extraordinary, or at least a few of them were extraordinary in their understanding of political science. Compared with those today who uh, deem themselves to be great students of political science, I don't think there's anything between them. So it's a kind of half answer. Hi. Hi, thank you for your talk today. Um, I was wondering, do you believe our modern government could ever foster a constantly updated constitution like Jefferson envisioned, or do you think the closest we could ever get is a wave of executive orders each time we change presidents? <laughs> you, know, you answered your same question. Uh, very, very well done and rhetorically apt. Um, yeah, I, uh, in connecting ourselves to the Constitution, it, uh, it doesn't mean, as I said, connecting yourself to every uh, uh, every 
particular phrase or idea. But it means going back and beginning your study of politics through their understanding of the process of, of, of creating a constitution. And there's so much, I assure you, that can be learned about politics from uh, going through that exercise that uh, I think it uh, stands heads and shoulders above a, uh, one of the myriads of executive orders that have been passed by the last president and, and, and this uh, president. Something goes wrong, there's an executive order that lasts for two days and there's another executive order. That's no way to, to govern it. It's a government really without law. Well, you see the, the, the understanding of what went into the Constitution is, is not such a simple event. So I tried to indicate that uh, founding a Constitution is difficult. Uh, it's a difficult enterprise. If you can master that, you're on your way, I think, uh, to, to a better appreciation of the Constitution. Uh, yeah, thank you. Americans, I, I mean, I'm, I'm curious what you would say. Americans think of of the Constitution as uh, inevitable, or it's really not something that can be changed. We don't speak of it that way. I mean, occasionally you hear someone say, let's have a constitutional convention, we do. That's a very, very minority opinion, right? And so... For, for Madison, maybe you said this, but I'd like to hear it again or more. Did, did, did Madison think of the writing of the Constitution and the fact that we, I believe it was, within, it's, it's within the original Constitution, how difficult it is to change the Constitution? Um, uh, in some ways, it works against the reverence of the Constitution because you, since you can't really change it, it doesn't, you know, you're not, you're not thinking about it very much um, uh, or defending it in a way. You just sort of accept it uh, or you accept that it, it, it to any, any sort of attempt to change it would probably tear the country apart, which I think it would. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Is that? Well, um, I mean, w one of the blessings is, b besides this idea of reverence, is people uh, tend to support the Constitution when it works in their favor. So, um, uh, and to be fierce proponents of the great thought of the founders. So th this is not a partisan statement, this is a fact. Go back to when uh, President Trump was being um, impeached. And if you watched any of those hearings, you say every uh, uh, Democratic legislator who spoke in favor of the uh, impeachment uh, began with um, pay on his pay to the founders and to how great the founders were and how they established this, and how these um, uh, uh, people were acting in the spirit of the founding without any problem, uh, as if they always follow the founding. Um, so uh, I don't know whether they do always follow the founding. I doubt, as I'll mention in, in a minute, whether they do. But um, uh, it was convenient for them. And in any political contest, you find that there are some people who act for strict principles, maybe two or three professors of political science at Providence College, maybe one or two at the University of Virginia, if that. Um, uh, but uh, a lot of people support the Constitution because it, it helps their cause. And that keeps shifting with each event. That's one of the things that helps maintain the Constitution, I believe. But, it, but in fact, overall, I would say that Americans uh, today, or many Americans, let's say our Americans elite, are less convinced, really, of uh, the, the importance of the Constitution. And if they had the power today and the votes, they would change it without thinking. Uh, some of the changes they offer argue, arguments for, for example, statehood for uh, Washington, D.C., someone will make an argument for or against. But I very uh, seldom hear them saying why this shouldn't be the case. It's just what they want without any uh, real deliberation on what the objections are. And time and time again, as you go through one element to the other, you see this to be the case. I think the standing disposition if not exactly on the Constitution, the standing disposition is we know better than the past. Uh, thank you. I also really enjoyed the long walk through history that we got and the really rich connections. And this, um, unfortunately, I'm a bad example for our students because I didn't take notes. So I don't remember all of the elements that you laid out of who counts as a founder. But I wonder, sort of 
you know, this has sort of opened up the, that question in a way. So, you know, there are those who talk of sort of the post-Civil War amendments as a kind of refounding, uh, right, in, in ways that they've sort of, and I, I, just, I just wonder what you think of, of that idea and whether this notion of a founder that you've sort of opened for us allow us to tell maybe a, a broader story of who the founders are. So there are these pivotal moments which don't come out of nowhere. They have their roots in this original founding that you're starting us with but they're fundamentally changing the nature of our association. And so you might include right, those post-Civil War amendments, you might include right, Brown v. Board of Education. It's not part of the written constitution, but it's certainly a written document that was part of the civic education I was given and the history I was taught about mm -hmm. the sort of fundamental nature of our association. Um, and so, so number one, I wonder if you think that's a promising thought, and two, I wonder, if connecting up to previous questions, if you think that's a way of reinvigorating this concern with the Constitution and also this idea of founders and reverence, that it's not this single point in history, but it's these multiple connected points in our history that define who we are. Yeah, thank you. Uh, in mentioning the uh, events of the 1860s, you, you put your finger on a, a great uh, issue in American political thought. Is uh, Lincoln, and I think Lincoln stands unique, some of these others made important change, but Lincoln stands uh, unique. Uh, was that a refounding? Does it deserve that status? Or was it just a, a, a revision of the original founding? And people go back and forth on that. No one was more conscious of this than Lincoln himself. I mean, when he, he left Springfield to become president, he said his task would be more difficult than George Washington, and, and he was right. And uh, came to appreciate some of his speeches that uh, show that uh, at the very least, we were pretty near a refounding, if not a refounding itself. At the same time, uh, Lincoln never tried to present it as a refounding. That's one of his interesting points. He never says we're starting over. He tried to connect this to the first founding. And if anything, if you look at uh, some of Lincoln's speeches, you see how much they uh, are in the same spirit of maintaining existing law. Um, of, uh, uh, you, you could change the, the law, but maintaining existing law and believing in the importance of existing law. Um, so his Lyceum address, a speech he gave quite early on in his life, is, is, is such an example. It's, it's as if, I think, he um, uh, had just read Federalist 49 and he gave the Lyceum address. It has the same language, the importance of establishing a constitution and, and remaining faithful to it. And, uh, the importance of reverence of the past is the only way we can preserve ourselves. The difficulty of maintaining reverence in a country where people are always looking for something new. All those elements are present. So my answer is, you know, uh, words are slippery things. And I think it's a good case could be made that this was a kind of refounding. Uh, some people call uh, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment the second founding, maybe. I think they were inspired in some way by the first founding, but uh, re remember this about our, our first founding, um, an interesting fact about it. Th they were in a tough situation, the, the founders in 1787, because the convention met. It wasn't clear to everyone whether the convention had the power to write a new constitution. They weren't given this power by Congress. So they sort of grabbed that uh, authority when it wasn't uh, given. Maybe an act uh, of, of what Lycurgus would call acting with duplicity to do so. But uh, in Philadelphia, they had no national army ob obedient to them. I mean, who could they call up to do anything? Uh, they were without any physical power to enforce. Everything they had to do had to be uh, achieved by a consensus of a kind. They were really in a, a very weak position compared to like Kyrgyz and others, unable to enforce things. And so uh, that, that was the situation in which they found themselves. You have to look to some of the things they might have wished for, but found it impossible to accomplish, and see whether Lincoln, in some ways, fulfills what they had hoped for in many respects. And um, I don't know, you, you said you'd be studying um, Frederick Douglass and everything. He sort of came to that conclusion, as you'll see when you study his understanding of the Constitution. Maybe true, maybe not, but the, he read, read the Constitution as, um, in a way, pointing in the direction to which we finally came after the Civil War. I think about five people in the queue right now, so I, I see those hands, but it'll take a minute to get there. 
Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, I really enjoyed it. So um, the Constitution starts with the words, we the people of the United States of America, which sort of makes it seem like the original founders were the American people uh, at large. But one of the main things I got from your talk is actually that that's a lie. Because, you know, as you, in your telling, founders are usually just one person or maybe a small group of people. And what they do is not just kind of set up a new political order, but also change what the masses think and feel. And, you know, come to think about it, the vast majority of Americans in 1787 had very little to do with the, um, definitely not with the writing, but not with the ratification of the Constitution either. Um, it was not ratified via a popular referendum. In fact, the only time the Constitution was put up to a popular referendum occurred right here in Rhode Island, and it was voted down by the people of Rhode Island. So I guess my question is, it sounds to me like what you're saying is that foundings are inherently undemocratic acts. Is that true? Wow. Well, uh, first consider it in context. All right, we know, for starters, as most people would say, we didn't have African Americans voting, slaves. Uh, we had African Americans in the North who had uh, the suffrage, but not, not, not as slaves in the South. Women didn't vote. So you can take every modern view and say uh, it didn't pass muster. But compared to the, the situation at the time, this was an awfully popular kind of event. That is, the ratification took place in some states by conventions uh, for the express purpose of, of agreeing to or rejecting the Constitution, which was a fa fairly popular uh, way of doing things. And in other places, it took place by the votes of the state legislatures, which were considered popular, vote, uh, po popular uh, forces within their state. So the connection to the people was fairly strong. I won't say it was universal, but it was fairly strong. There was no other way to do it. Uh, uh, there was no national government to have a national ballot. So uh, it strikes me it was, uh, I, I don't know, uh, pre pre pretty close to uh, a democratic uh, vote at the time, F fairly close to a democratic vote at the time and um, uh, establishes then the principle of we the people in, in all, all of its vigor. That, that's what I would say, you know, give them a break uh, uh, as to how we would proceed. And I don't think it took place in opposition to the wishes of the people. I think the wishes of the people were expressed in favor of the Constitution. You could argue that both ways. This uh, ratification debate was very tight. No one knew who was going to win at the beginning. No one knew that this Constitution was going to pass. Uh, and it was uh, uh, a, a vigorous debate, and I think the founders had the better of the debate. The Federalist Papers is a superior work of thought and had some influence. Uh, so I, I'd, I'd give the Democratic a, a kind of a, you know, three quarters plus, maybe not 100 percent. Thank you very much. Thank you for a very insightful talk. Uh, my question um, focuses on this el element of reverence, reverence for the Constitution. Oh. And you have spoke about it almost as if, like the Ark of the Covenant, it's held in, in great reverence. And I'm thinking about uh, models of, of what's going on here. And a lot of the emphasis that we had, the majority of the talk was sort of the, Rome, the Greek and Roman model. But you think also of, OK, we don't want the center of the charisma to be a person but rather it to be the text. Right. And it, it, we've sort of elevated the, the Constitution, if not to be God, then at least almost like a, a, an encounter with God almost, right? Like that, that there was a, a moment of the, the divine coming down and coming to us, and this is something special, and we're going to revere it. And I was just wondering... Um, I mean, one of the things is a swearing of oath of a, you know to follow the Constitution, and I'm I'm reminded of an element that, that didn't come up as such in the talk, but um, in the Middle Ages, which I work on, you know, the king is a king by ruling rightly, right? This English constitutional uh, idea of you you know you're not supposed to be above the law, but even the king is subject to the to the law, if not a tyrant. So I was just wondering if 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 
the emphasis is more, not so much on the founding fathers, or the found, maybe they're just patriarchs, maybe they're more like a sort of a Moses figure or, or something like that. And the, the important thing is, is intentionally not focusing on the founders as such, but more on this moment and the mythology of the text. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you would, I don't know if I sent a good question there, but if you have any thoughts on that thrust of an idea. Uh, in the first place, uh, I'm a little bit um, in disagreement with the fact that it can be the text without thinking of what the founders did. Since so much of the, the thought that went behind the Constitution is embodied in the political science that they, um, uh, that they use and which is presented in certain sources. So I would think that in this case, we wanted to, the, the people who read the Constitution to go back to the, the reason behind the Constitution. Um, the, the, the logic behind the Constitution. Now, not everyone necessarily follows reason or logic, hence the need for reverence and veneration, but, but the reason and logic are embodied in the, in the, the thought of the founders. And that, that's where these courses should start. You just can't read the, the text of the Constitution. Honestly, I assign it, but I know that the students fall asleep. You know, it's not very long. I, I got it right here close to my heart all the time, but it, it, it's not very long and um, it's a little boring. But um, when you, when you read the, uh, what went into it, the thought on every question that they had to debate and understand, you see the, the, the logic of it. So uh, I, I think Madison wanted, or I'm supposing that Madison wanted the founders, meaning chiefly the, the chief founders, meaning chiefly the, the ones who presented it uh, as, as being remembered, and us connected to them because we're connected to the most important thing. Now there's this other problem. I'm happy you brought it up. Uh, I was thinking of bringing it up, but it's a little off the subject or complicated. These words, reverence and veneration. So we immediately, when we hear these words, we connect them, or many will connect them with religious things. Because, you know, everyone says, well, isn't re a religion, doesn't it um, preach reverence and veneration? But, but, but not so fast, I think. The ones who actually um, uh, made this reverence and veneration so close to religion were the critics of the founders, as Jefferson did. He, he's the one who brings up religion. He's the Ark of the Covenant. He's the one who goes back and says, oh, the, these people are treating the Constitution like it's something sacred and um, uh, makes fun of it. Similarly, if you read the uh, progressives at the turn of the century, the same thing. They accuse the, the people who want to keep the Constitution. The, the uh, progressives, by the way, were in favor of changing the Constitution, many of them. Uh, they, they mock this idea of, of this being a religious event. Not, not so. so. So they're the ones who do it. And they're the ones who, who, who take after the founders on this basis. I think reverence and veneration have, uh, um, as Madison used them, are slightly different than the religious meaning of those terms. And that, that's a difficult question. What words would you use in English uh, that express that idea of something very important without using reverence or veneration. I, I'm not sure if there are better words, but I'm sure that Madison never meant that they would be religious, and it's the opponents who did it. There's a, a, a guy who, uh, uh, not a guy, a person, who um, uh, began the magazine called The Economist by the name of Walter Badgett. And uh, he, made, he, he wrote this book on the British Constitution, and he said, I, I like this idea, he says there's two elements to the British Constitution, he gave him a name. There's the dignified part and the efficient part. Well, the efficient part, he means the machinery of government that Boris Johnson now leads, the, the parliament and all that. But what's the dignified part? The dignified part is where you're attached to something through your disposition and your heart a little bit. And that's, of course, the, the monarchy. Uh, I don't know, I, I, I kind of like the, the monarchy more or less. Not, not, certainly not everything that the monarchs and the monarch family does. But the idea of the monarchy is kind of a nice idea. It ties people to the past. So that's the dignified part, and it certainly is a nice word. I think that gets closer to what the founders meant by veneration and reverence. And Lincoln even more strongly using those terms. He is a visceral attachment has to exist for the law. But again, um, not, not necessarily a, 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 a view of revelation, which I think cheapens revelation in its real sense uh, and um, misunderstands the founding. That's a hazard, I guess, on that. So we have more hands than um, I think we have official time. 
I'm going to go to the next question, Professor Hudson. And Derek, already asked your question. Okay. Um, so I'll ask one more question, and then you know, will those of you who who want or need to make a break for it, go for it. But I think we, you know, those of you who still have questions that would be more than welcome to remain, and we could talk a little bit longer. I think, but I just want to have an official break after after the next question and response. So. Um, First off, thank you for coming to uh, Providence College. Absolute privilege to be able to listen to you today. Truly appreciate it. So you talked about a couple things in your talk, and you mentioned uh, about the Obama administration. One of uh, his colleagues, they said a crisis would be a terrible thing to waste. That was Rob Emanuel. Yeah. And uh, going off of that, you also said that authority initially comes from taking advantage of an opportunity. So if a crisis is a terrible thing to waste, in a sense, it is an opportunity, isn't it? Yeah. So if the crisis is an opportunity, uh, and you're going to take advantage of that opportunity, in a time right now where it seems like we have a particular weak ex executive leader, and we're in a time of crisis, as it's been pitched to us at least, do you think that a lot of the JV junior varsity politicians that are in play now for my generation who are pushing a lot of ideas which fundamentally change the way our government would work, such as abolishing the filibuster or change the number of justices in the Supreme Court, do you think that they would consider themselves to be engaging in some sort of refounding or consider themselves founders themselves? <clears throat> yes. Good, 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 good point. Um, uh, um, maybe by the time they're in a position to achieve power, they will have grown up. Uh, that would be one hope. Or they're not as strong as uh, right now as um, they make themselves out to be. Uh, so I have some doubts about, for all the noise they make and the influence they have, um, uh, whether it's anywhere near a majority. But, but, but time will tell. There's certainly uh, an influ influential uh, group of people. There's uh, no doubt about that. So that would be my, my, my answer to, to them. As for the things that you mentioned, uh, you mentioned the changing the Electoral College or, or the, the number of people on the judiciary. Yeah, I, it is true that changing the number of people on the judiciary is a, a, a pretty important change. But keep in mind that it's not unconstitutional. Um, I, I think that's important to note. Uh, you can change the number of justices. Uh, I don't think it's a good idea right now, but maybe that's because I'm a, a little bit, you know, more reticent than they are. But um, th they could say and th that we have to look into the number of judges on the court, and it should be more than it is, and begin to make a case for that. Begin to make a case for that that one would hope doesn't merely serve their own interests, but presents a, a logical reasons for doing so. And I, I guess if it took place, I, I couldn't say that it was contrary to the Constitution. It might not be a good idea, it might be for bad motives, but it, it could be a good idea. Um, people raise questions about age of uh, the justices. Um, could there be a change on this, that people have ages where they become uh, a, a president? Could there be ages where you, uh, in the future where uh, you can't be elected president? These are things that could be debated. And it, it's a question now. I don't want to take any partisan views, but a lot of people say that uh, the current president shouldn't be president for reasons of A, B, and C, that he's not who he was. So, so maybe people beyond a certain age should not be. Um, so, so all of these things are, are possible ways of looking at things, and I, and I do make that distinction between what's legally constitutional and what is maybe a good or bad idea. Caesar, are, will you be good for a couple more questions? I, I'm good. Okay, so let's let's do it like they do it at rock concerts. We'll give the the standing ovation, right, and then everybody can head for the exit, and then we'll have the encore after head that. Head to the hills. That's right. So.